Okay, glad to have you all here. Hope you all have had a great weekend, great week. It is hot here in Austin, Texas. Last week was hot records, and they expect us to be hot here again all this week and beyond that. But anyway, hope that you are staying cool and hydrated where you're at and having a good time. But uh, tonight's topic is all about the due diligence checklist. I get a lot of questions from people, our coaching students, about exact due diligence. Because it's a little bit different if you're doing due diligence on a note versus a property. And so that's why we've had different due diligence. We've had a short due diligence checklist. We've got a longer one. It's like an engineer's wet dream. And a few months back, I went in through and edited the due diligence checklist and kind of consolidated down from 21 pages to four pages. It's amazing what you'll change and tweak some things and then obviously space it a little bit easier. I didn't want to do it the double space that was on before. So tonight we'll go through the 17 different things you need to look at for due diligence and break down each one. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions. I'm going to, as we get to the end of a section, I'll open up for questions. I'm literally just going to go through the checklist. I'm not going to really dive into a whole PowerPoint on it. Just going to pull the checklist and go for there. But before we dive in that, once again, if you are joining us for the first time, I know Night in America, we're glad to have you. Uh, we've been doing these now for 13 years of some sort from the Monday note to note Night in America. Um, we also have the podcast and you can listen to Note Night in America, our Note Closer Show podcast, even Note Camp, anywhere that you download, listen to podcasts, whether it's on Apple, Spotify, FM, whatever. Um, YouTube, we're big on there, guys. We have the number one YouTube channel out there for you to join it. But I do want to let you know what we'll spend some time on tonight. We'll, we're going to spend a big chunk of the time on our upcoming live event in Austin, Texas. And I see some folks on the call tonight, Don, John. Uh, a few of you guys that are registered, we'll get the, the location out to the hotel for you here in the next day or so, Anya. Uh, but we're glad to have you. We're doing our first in-person workshop in over five years. I was cracking up because uh, today popped up a reminder of seven years ago, we did our first Note Camp event wrap-up, which is pretty interesting. But we're doing a, a three-day class here in Austin for our note buying workshop. It's the nuts and bolts, the A to Z of how to buy and invest in non-performing notes. Yes, we'll talk about performing notes. It's July 21 to the 23rd, so we're just over three weeks out. All right, it'll be three weeks this, this Friday. And we're really excited because we're basically going to be doing it 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday will probably wrap up a little bit earlier because folks will be putting flights out. Uh, tickets are normally $9.97 to our three-day class. We have a great special running through the rest of the week. Started at $1.99. It goes up by $5 per person. So still at a great price for you to take advantage of it and get in a huge discount, you know, 70% or 80% off what they normally are. Um, it includes the manual that's coming along with it, a lot of case studies, the doodle just checklist we'll be going through tonight. Uh, but we're really excited about this class. We're limiting it to just 50 people. We're already halfway there. And we're going to have a great time um, here in Austin, Texas for our note buying workshop. And like I said, if you're not, if you're interested in learning about how to buy and invest in non-performing notes, this is a class that you want to attend. No, we will not be live streaming this. Um, because I, you know, when I do my live classes, they're more intimate with a lot of great questions and we're just not going to record it. If you got to be here to enjoy it. All right. And have a lot of great time with it now. So if you can go to notebuyingfordummies.com, you can get registered for this class very easy. Um, I think tickets are at 229 right now. So they've gone up a little bit. We have uh, quite a few of our WCN crew folks that are signed up as well and have a special discount as well. And some of our coaching students are going to be there too. So it's going to be a great event. Uh, so love to have you there. Love you, have you here in Austin, Texas with us for three days. Come in out of the hot, the heat for some cool deals, and we'll make sure and have a great time on helping you dive into the world of note investing. And may have the opportunity to even bid on some deals uh, that we pull aside for our students that are here as well. I know that we'll have probably about a dozen different case studies for you guys to work through throughout the weekend. And I know a lot of people love that, and we'll focus on the full day of finding deals. Day two is about funding and raising capital and marketing. Day three is about the exit strategies and flipping. We'll go through a whole lot of things in between there. So check it out at notebuyingfordummies.com. So love to have you guys here in Austin. But anyway, um, first of all, I also want to say thank you. I didn't realize this, but yesterday we celebrated our 14th year of WCN being about reclose notes being around as a business. I've been doing this longer than 14 years. I've been buying notes since 2008. But uh, I want to give a big thank you to everybody that's been commenting online, wishing me stuff on LinkedIn. That's one of the great things about LinkedIn, alerting you to your birthdays and your business anniversaries. And we've been doing this for a while. So uh, thank you for helping us make us the number one YouTube channel, the number one podcast, number one place for that's investor recommended when it comes to our training 
and coaching program. So glad to have you guys here for you. So anyway, let's dive into tonight's topic, due diligence checklist. And this is going to be primarily on non-performing notes. Performing notes are pretty simple, but you need to know about non-performing because everybody deals with non-performing. No matter how good you are with performing and even writing your own notes or creating your notes, you got to understand what to do in the non-performing side of things when things go bad, because you're going to see more of this stuff hitting the market. Um, I was just watching a video from a buddy of mine, Nicholas Gurley, talking about how a lot of Airbnbs are starting to struggle with, you know, 40, 50, 60% income on a month in, month out basis being reduced. Um, the city of Dallas just outlawed Airbnbs at the end of the year. So Austin's outlawed Airbnbs inside the city limits for about a year, two years now. So that's just one thing that's making things a little bit interesting, but we're not here to talk about Airbnb. We're here to talk about due diligence. So let me pull this up and we'll go from there. And if you're part of the WCN crew, don't worry. This is already in your base camp file folder. If you're a one-on-one coaching student, you should have already had this email to me. Just, but if you'd like to get a copy of this, hey, just sign up for the workshop or sign up to be a part of our WCN crew and you'll get uh, access to this list here for you. So let me share my screen and we'll go from there. All right. So we call this then the NPN Note Evaluation and Due Diligence Checklist. And there's 17 parts to it, right? Now, the most important part is when you get a tape in, <laughs> number one is when you're acquiring a tape, Ask the pricing expectations and when bids are due. That's the first part. If you don't ask it what price expectations are, they don't give you anything or they just get a tape in, you, you're going to be really lost in what how to bid. I'll give you a great example. We went through a, a, a tape, was it last week it was? I believe 14 notes that we kind of went through real fast. The seller told us highest and best. Well, we made our offers. And then the seller comes back after we were offers and says, oh, the seller wanted par and all this non-performing stuff. And I'm like, if you'd have told me that, I wouldn't have wasted any energy on this. And I asked, what's the price point? And they're like, oh, highest and best. I'm like, okay. So this is what you gotta be careful of. Always ask and find out what's going on. Now, the second part is filtering the tape. If you don't understand Excel, learn it. I'm not gonna teach it to you. By filtering, it means basically you're organizing the tape by states, then by cities. So it's all in, basically you got from Alabama down to Wyoming and alphabetical and states and counties together, okay? I like to remove New York and New Jersey. I also get rid of Chicago because Cook County is difficult unless you live there. I also get rid of Wisconsin because Wisconsin is high property taxes. That's different. That's just my information of what I focus on. Okay. I also want to look at the last payment date and make sure it's greater than 90 days past due. Sometimes they'll give you the number of days. Sometimes they'll show you the month the last payment was made, when it was last credited. And that's if you're looking for non performing, that's one thing you want to do. I always want to get a thing that's over 90 days. I actually prefer. I guess that's usually six months or greater. Uh, if they've got a property type, get rid of mobile homes, manufactured homes, land, I get rid of that stuff. Okay, I'm gonna look at the BPO values next. Anything that's, I wanna make sure that my BPOs are, are values are greater than two, uh, 25,000 and the unpaid balance is also greater than 25,000. I'm gonna remove assets with uh, P&I, principal and interest payments below 250, unless you're using your own funds. If you're using somebody else's funds, you definitely wanna be above that 250 per month. I also like to get rid of assets with less than 10 years of experience or 10 years of payments remaining just because it's a lot of principles being bought down there. It's harder if you're in the last 10 years or 30-year mortgage to bring on somebody to fund your deals. Unless you're getting such a huge discount, you really got to run your amortization tables to make sure everything's good. You may also want to remove vacant assets um, that have been non-performing for three or more years as they may need extensive repair or especially, you know, like I said, vacant assets. You're not usually going to have somebody in there that you can get reperforming. Um, number three here is more on the asset to get rid of the for, filter for undesirable locations. I like to map my spreadsheet with Batch Geo and get rid of very rural locations, small counties, small cities. I'll use Google Earth to take a look at, at the property. I'm looking for negative features such as uh, tarps, boarded up windows, uh, drug deals taking place, trashed out houses on the block, that kind of stuff. Um, I'll look for high crime areas also. Um, like I said, I'll get rid of small C's, really less than $10,000 popula uh, 10, in population unless you have resources there. Like I grew up in a small town, about 4,000 people down in South Texas. I know that area. My mom lives in a small town down in the Nick Woods, but I know that area and I have resources down there, so I don't mind buying there. I wouldn't recommend somebody new buying there if you don't have any resources, okay? Um, 
You also may want to get removed troubled areas of states that have extensive licensing issues or domestic uh, issues, unfriendly landlord landlord states like Oregon, California, Washington state require some extensive licensing. Um, you know, those are some states that are difficult to foreclose in and you probably just want to avoid those. Number four is obviously checking taxes in the borrower's name and mailing address. This is pretty easy through Netra Online. You want to make sure the names match up on the tape as it does on the county website. Uh, if the name does not match, you also want to check for a previous tax sale or deed transfer to see what's going on. If it's more than a current year taxes owed, you definitely want to reduce your bid by this amount and, and put a column in that spreadsheet for how much is owed. Now, hopefully they've given you pricing expectations so you can run a column down there to figure out, okay, what kind of percentage are they looking for off of UPB or the payoff or the legal amount, stuff like that. But you got to know how that number compares to your fair market value. So you're going to want to estimate fair market value. Many companies will use Zillow or Trulia.com or Homes or Real Estate Yahoo, whatever. Uh, if it's in Texas, most of the time, I used to be able to take the, the county appraisal value and multiply it times 1.05 or 1.1. 1 .1. Um, you know, if you've got a realtor friend, you can use NARRPR to run a, a virtual report for you. Like I said, I want my fair market value to be greater than 25 and then really less than 250 for modifications. Anything really over 250, 300,000, it's going to be harder to modify. And the, the most accurate play as an ROI is going to be to foreclose in most cases. Okay, and take the property back or a deed to loom. Uh, if there's no sales activity in the area in six months, 180 days on market, that's important to know when you're talking to a realtor, you're going to either want to remove the asset or reduce your bid to a 30-day quick sale price, which is going to be a whole lot cheaper than the true market value. Um, like I said, assets above 250K will primarily be deed in or foreclosures on that because that's just the number going to work out. It's probably not going to make sense for you to modify or reinstate that loan. Um, you're gonna have people that file bankruptcy or drag stuff out in a lot of cases that can reduce your ROI. Uh, number six, deter determine your fair market rental rate. Use rentometer.com, Zillow, or Craigslist if you can't find somebody on there. Like I said, I'll type in like a three bedroom, two bath, and put the zip code on Craigslist, and that will often give me some solutions. Rentometer is usually the best source for Zillow, would be number two. Okay. Number seven, if the legal balance or payoff column is not included, you'll need to determine this. And that's what I what I usually do is I just take the P&I payment times the number of months since the last payment. I'll add this amount to the UPB column, the unpaid principal balance column to estimate a rough legal balance. I know that's not 100% accurate. You could also add 5% late fees on the payments amount, but that's usually what I'll do to get a, a quick rough legal estimate. Um, there may be, you know, when you look at taxes owed, you're gonna wanna add taxes uh, to that number as something that's going to be part of the, it has to be paid to some sort if you have to foreclose. So keep that in mind. Number eight, I'm going to reshuffle, refilter the tape, restore the tape for equity and negative equity deals. Equity deals would will be assets where the legal balance is below the estimated market value. If it's an equity deal, I'm probably going to have to be somewhere around 75, 80 cents of the uh, unpaid balance or the legal balance in a non-performing note. If it's a Negative equity deals would be assets where the legal balance is above value, then I can be at the, at the stair step method, the 50, 60, 70 cents on the dollar, depending on where it's located and, and how far they are, what state they are for foreclosure. Um, like I said before, you're going to ask for price expectations. If they have not given to you, then you got to put your, your price expectations roughly in there and calculate what you're going to offer and start calculating estimated ROIs. I always like to put an annual cash flow for occupied assets. That's where I take principal and interest amount and multiply times 12 months and divide it by the purchase price now what i also do is i'll put a column in there and calculate if i can get them to modify i'm gonna have them bring some skin to the game at least four months of payment so then i would do another column in there 12 uh, 16 months of p and i divide by the purchase price will give me a rough roi okay if the last payment is older than three years the loan modification is not likely to happen especially if we look at what's going on think about three years ago that was in the midst of COVID. So if somebody was behind when COVID started, they're probably not going to get back on track relatively easy, okay? Like I said before, uh, equity deals at 80% of legal balance. If that number does not make sense as ROI for you, then drop it down. You got to realize that some of these mortgages just are not going to make sense because they have low, low interest rates, especially the ones that occupy. It's just not going to make sense for you to modify those and make a a 4% if they reinstate, you know, it's more of a foreclosure process. Okay. Um, if they've got negative equity deals, here's your rough stair-step pricing figure. 
Anything at $30,000 or below, the max you would pay is 25% of the fair market value. If it's in the 30K range, 35%. 40K range, multiplied times 45%. 50K range, the 55% of value. Anything really above 50,000, the seller is going to, especially if you're buying individually, they're going to want you to probably pay 55% plus, 60% plus. Depends on how much that profit is on that back end if you foreclose and you're only paying 60 cents of the dollar. Now, if it's in a longer foreclosure market, reduce it. If it's in a faster foreclosure market like Texas, Georgia, you may need to bump it up to 70%. Uh, it's going to vary on an asset by asset basis how far behind they are if they start illegal or haven't started illegal within the state foreclosure time frame. Okay. Number 10, you're going to price the note offering based on your numbers. Look at the unpaid taxes again. If you need to get an APN number, um, I call that the asset property number. For a tax lookup, what some of these counties were required, go to 41.com and type in the address and we'll give you that number. Um, it's always good to check the bankruptcy status. If you see that as a previous BK, a chapter 13 on the tape, you can go to pacer.gov and find the owner's name on there and download what's going on with it. If there is an HOA, like especially in a condo or a higher area, nicer area, um, you may want to check previous listings off the off of uh, uh, Google to find the HOA inf information, maybe a, a pre previous listing or previous something on Zillow that talks about the HOA in information, okay? Now, you're going to want to, besides subtracting your back property taxes, you also get to look at the HOAs in some states. Some some states will, like Florida, Las Vegas, um, I mean, you know, Nevada, Florida, and Colorado will have like a safe harbor where they reduce the HOA fees, but a lot of other states, you're going to have to pay the whole HOAs due. So maybe something you're negotiating as a second lien in some cases. All right. Um, but look at your bids, subtract your back taxes, subtract your roughly other fees that you can't reduce. You're not going to re reduce it by foreclosure costs because you're usually buying the stuff at a discount. Your foreclosure costs, carrying costs should be in that, that 20, 30, 40% discount that you're getting. Okay. But me, when I run my numbers, especially if it's occupied and I take that 12 months or I take that 16 months, specifically the 12 months or greater, I want to see a 15% ROI to get it reperforming. And if it's if I'm gonna have to foreclose where it's vacant, I want to see at least a minimum of 20% ROI on the foreclosure side after my costs. Okay, now I obviously you're not gonna know repairs. This is why we look at occupied assets because there's often be less repairs for the most part. So we're not really worried about this on the front end. We're worried more about this. Let's get some numbers in and see what they come back in, and you can dive in deeper into your repair costs, stuff like that, as your offers are accepted. Okay. 11, you submit your offer, get it in. Send in a spreadsheet as an attachment to the seller with any notes regarding why your bids are below pricing guidelines. You know, talk about the condition of the property. Maybe talk about taxes, though. Maybe see, hey, there's a huge HOA fee that's not going away. You know, that's important things. That if they offer accepts, if they accept your offer, that's a great thing. Congratulations. Start paying for the due diligence process. But you always want to make sure you have it under you start paying for things. If they give you a verbal yes, especially on a Friday, all right, I need to see a loan sale agreement of something on Monday before you start ordering that stuff. If it's countered, then you're gonna renew your numbers and accept decline or counter. If, if it's not accepted and they just decline your offer, say somebody else got accepted, then mark your calendars for 30 days out to follow back up with a seller on offering the same offering. Cause a lot of times bids will fall out during due diligence. And uh, we've gotten a lot of deals accepted 30 days after the fact when deals didn't sell, okay? Seller would rather probably fade it a little bit, reduce the offering uh, or go back to, you know, if you're the second highest offer, but you're not the highest, they know that you probably did a little due diligence. A lot of times they'll say, okay, we'll go with this more accurate number. And that gets into the due diligence side of things. Order title update or an owner report. We use Baldwin Advisory Group, Dickey Baldwin's group. Obviously that's going to look for outstanding liens or judgments that would affect your ability to foreclose or accept a deed in lieu. It's going to show taxes. We're also going to verify fair market value, either hiring, uh, paying for a BPO from Baldwin Advisory Group or through a third-party realtor. Or if you've got a realtor that can pull a NAR report or a local CMA and do a drive-by, then that's a great place to go with. If the value comes in below your estimated value, you're going to need to reduce or fade your bid per, by a percentage amount below. So if it's 10% below, drop it 10%. If the, now, if it comes back... Um, and the asset is in poor condition, you may want to just go ahead and cancel your bid. Like I was bidding on a couple performing notes down in the valley and online the eyes look good and the online uh, photos look good. But when the actual BPO came in, it properly looked like ass. 
somebody was living in it, but it looked, I don't know, it was a bad condition. So I, I just sort of canceled my bid because the asset was not one to be. If I had to take that asset back at the price that they wanted me to and that borrower stopped making payments, I would be upside down that deal. It's not a good deal. <coughs> of course, if the value comes in above your value, the seller thinks it's worth 100, comes in at 150, that's congratulations, close as soon as you can. <laughs> But always, always, always put eyes on your asset. Have somebody drive by, another investor, take some photos, a realtor, pay somebody to go do it, you can do it. Um, you always want to verify occupancy status. That means calling the utility departments and checking in depth with them. Um, you want to see if the borrower is active military by going on to the military website, checking them out, see if they're active duty. <laughs> I like to run a skip trace for every borrower that we're going to close on, and I have Baldwin Advisor do that. That gives me emails, phone numbers. Um, a variety of different information that I can pull. I also will jump on Facebook and LinkedIn and look for social media updates of the bar, see if I can't track them down on there. And that's worked really, really well for us in the past. Uh, if the bar has filed bankruptcy and it's listed on the spreadsheet, ask to actually speak to the trustee who's representing the seller or download the BK filing from pacer.gov. Uh, make sure if it's a BK chapter 13 that the payment plan makes sense for your number. Sometimes sellers will not show up to the trustee or the bankruptcy filing. And the court will approve a bankruptcy plan that doesn't make any sense for you. And you can get stuck buying a note you think it's be one payment, but now you've got this bankruptcy payment that just doesn't make any sense. So careful about that. Um, as you're doing due diligence, you always want to ask the sellers to provide proof of insurance. Make sure to review servicing company uh, for the property insurance. If the borrower is not paying, ask for its FCC force place insurance policy from the seller. The seller is not paying a force place insurance policy. You will want to get your own policy on the property, and that will be a cost to you. You may need to reduce your bid a little bit for the cost of that, okay? Get bid before closing. Insurance can often kill a deal in Houston, Texas, or Florida, other places that have rough, okay? Careful, especially in states where they're pulling out of, like, you know, California has a big, has a rough time. Uh, insurance costs there can kill a deal because it, it's an expense that's just going to murder your, your profits, okay? Um, you may need to reduce your or cancel your bid altogether if insurance comes back is, 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 is too high. Okay. As you're going through your due diligence, obviously you talked about the property, we've talked to borrower. That's a good thing. You know, what's going on file on title and stuff. But you also got to look at collateral files. That's number 14. You're not going to get a hard collateral file. You're going to get a scanned PDF copies of the collateral file. But you make sure you sure as hell get that stuff before funding. And always look through that. <clears throat> always take the time. I mean, maybe a lot of stuff, but make sure you've got these items in need. You need the original note. Mortgage or deed of trust. Now, if it's recorded, it's pretty easy. You can just go in the records and look at it. But, and that's one thing you should always do is look for recorded assignments to make sure they're filed at the county. You need an assignment of mortgage each time the note has been sold. You need an allonge for each AOM. You're going to ask for servicing notes from the servicer. And, and they may just send you some generic notes, but ask for in-depth notes. Ask for in-depth payment history as well. Also ask for a current payoff statement from the current servicing company because the last thing you want if the seller has paid a big chunk in the past and that's not reflected accurately. This is why I don't like to buy notes that are self-serviced because the self-servicing is the number is always wrong. Okay. Um, if you can get the financials, like the financial documents that the borrower filled out, the 1003 loan application, anything finals, uh, financials is great. Make sure they're Dodd-Frank compliant. Uh, if it's an owner finance note, you want to see if there's a Dodd-Frank certificate in there as well. Um, obviously the bankruptcy report we've discussed. Uh, ask to get any legal status. If it's the, the legal story started, ask to speak to the attorney via email or see the email notes from the attorney. Do not take the, the seller's word. Say, I need to see something in writing and tell me where they're at, okay? Also, make sure if you see that this loan has been modified that you're looking to loan modification agreements. Make sure your payments that it's modified to match up with the strategy. We've seen this screw up some things, especially lately, where people have modified, the spreadsheet shows a 30-year mortgage, but the modification is a 50-year, which reduces the monthly payment dramatically. And what does that do? It reduces your ROI. We've also seen modifications where the borrower made normal payments for 12 months and then didn't make, only made a one-cent payment for months 20, uh, 13 through 36. That can really shoot yourself in the foot, okay? If anything is missing, ask for them to provide. Do not fund at all if the AOMs are missing. Now, if the launches are missing here or there, that's okay. But the AOMs, the assignment of mortgages, get those before you fund. Do not fund before you get those. Or the collateral file. 
Okay, copy the note. Um, if the AOMs are not in the file order, like I said, check the county recorder. They may have been filed and just not showing up in scan file folder. If they're showing up on the county recorder, that's good. Okay. Um, if you can, make sure there's a lender's title policy. If it's owner finance, some sellers will won't do a title policy, and I'll ask them to cover that out of expenses. Like, hey, I need you to put title insurance on this or I'm going to reduce my bid by that amount. Um, look specifically, too, for hardship letters that the borrower may have sent in, letters, short sale docs. Uh, any type of hardships, they'll tell you, I mean, if it's a good hardship letter, then the bar will tell you what they would like to try to accomplish. A low mod, a deed lieu, whatever it is, it, this, this will literally give you insight into the mind of the bar, which is so valuable for you. Uh, if the bar is deceased, you see like ETAL, estate of, look for look for uh, heirs, look for a deed lieu or loan assumption, maybe in some cases. Now, of course, you can't get the dead borrower to sign a deed lieu. But if there's a co borrower on it, they could do that. If there's errors, you may be able to do a deed and lose straight from the, um, as we like to say, from the, uh, um, oh my God, the uh, probate court in some cases. Okay. Um, the servicing company, you got to do due diligence servicing companies because not all servicing companies are created equal and all of them suck in some sort of matter. Okay. You want to take a look at your servicing company. Um, or the existing servicing company and see if they make sense. Ask, hey, is this servicing company good? Is they expensive? I need to see, uh, make sure that they're licensed to collect in the payment, you know, in the states that you're buying the note in. If they, you know, there's some services out there that are not licensed in every state. And that's okay. If they don't have any notes in, that, in a state, they don't need to be licensed. In it. But if you're buying a note in, say, Oregon, and that servicer is not licensed in Oregon, that's a big red flag for you. Okay. Look at the payment terms, rates for service. There's always an a la carte menu. Um, some of them may require a minimum amount of loans, a minimum bill amount. Um, like I said, ask for referrals. If they, who's, who's worked with BSI? Who's worked with NAA? Who's worked with Madison Management? Those kind of things, okay? Normal cost for a performing loan can run you from like $15 to $30 per month. A non-performing note can run you from like 90 bucks a month, plus the other legal workout costs. So figure that into your numbers. Servicing transfer will take usually 15 to 30 days after closing. And that's the transfer of like the electronic information before the new servicing company can contact the borrower. Okay. So you're going to look at two weeks to a month. Now, I don't wait around for that. One of the things that we teach our students to do is send out your own hello letter with payment instructions or options seven days after closing. And it's a letter we give our students listen here. You close on a note, you send this letter out immediately to get the ball rolling. Okay. Tell them who to call, your new servicing company, or to give you a call, or call your attorney, all right? This will help expedite the borrower reaching out for modifications or payment options faster. You know if the borrower doesn't respond to it, then you start the legal process to start, or continue the legal process to start the foreclosing, okay? Servicing companies will not transfer loans if servicing costs have not been paid by the seller. So like if I owe money to my servicing company on a loan and I sell it, that servicing company is going to hold that loan ransom for ransom before they sue it. So that's one thing to ask, hey, is your servicing costs paid up on this? If not, then I need to reduce the cost by this and I'll pay it. Or want to make sure that a big chunk of it, whatever, you know, whatever is owed goes to the servicer. Okay. Um, one of the things to ask, like I said, is if there's an existing attorney on there, hey, has the attorney fees for foreclosure been taken care of? Or you want to ask if you can retain counsel and speak with the attorney, make sure complaints, you know, are tra are transferred to your LLC, that you're now the plaintiff handling you know, the foreclosure. You gotta be careful about that. Um you know, talk with the attorney about possible exit strategies that have not already, already explored. Have this, you know, because some sellers will have one or two strategies. They won't entertain everything else. And those strategies may be different for you. Like the seller may not be interested in doing a loan mod, but you might be. So talk to the attorney and see hey, has the borrower expressed any interest on stuff like that. Okay. Um, make sure the attorney and your servicing company is aware of what loss mitigation strategies that you or your servicer has worked out with the borrower. You can always delay a foreclosure auction. That's the beautiful thing about that. After closing, Work with your servicing company to assign you an asset manager. Every servicer should give you an asset manager who handles your notes, your portfolio. So schedule a call with them. Talk to your asset manager at least once per month on your strategy for your non-performing notes and options available for workouts. You know, I wouldn't call them the first through the fifth because they're getting payments in, but maybe the 10th or maybe after the 15th with the second option. And if somebody's not paying, find out what you can do. Door knockers, reduce settlements, modifications, a whole variety of things that your servicer can work out with you. And what they can do. If the foreclosure is not already started, make sure you start it after 30 days. Like I said before, you can always stop it. Okay. Um, 
after closing, everything turns out, then obviously closing, then it's all about getting the collateral files. And the collateral files will re usually re you know, receive 30 to 45 days after closing. It's pretty normal. You should get a copy of the AOM, though, relatively quickly. Okay, and I'm talking get a scanned copy of the signed and notarized AOM at least within a week after you close after your fund. Okay. Um, when you get in the collateral file and the hard file shows up, then you need to make sure that any AOMs or contract for deeds that are not recorded get recorded. Um, make sure you can um, make sure you get them recorded in the, the correct order as far as date. Many counties offer electronic recording. Um, if not, Baldwin Advisory Group does have a vendor that you can use to help record. Um, Look at the hard collateral file. You may see notes in there, pictures. There may be signed deed and lieu, insurance checks, all sorts of stuff. I've seen the keys. I've literally seen just about anything in there. There's so much valuable information that is not scanned oftentimes in electronic file folders that you can help you in that workout or the exercise. I mean, we bought notes. We thought we were going to foreclose. We opened the file folder, and there's a signed deed and lieu with the keys on there. I'm like, okay, we ain't got to go the legal route. We don't even really need to transfer servicing. Let's just go straight. They got a deed in lieu. Let's go record the deed in lieu. They're out of the house. Let's list the property for sale. Okay. Um, let's see here. You'll want to rescan. If you see that the hard copy is different than what the scan copy want, go ahead and rescan the collateral file. Okay. Um, you may want to um, get a different file for the legal documents. So all the filings may be in a different collateral file. So you may want to scan those separately. Um, and you'll need for your attorney or legal counsel to foreclose, they're going to need to have the original copies of stuff. So go ahead and maybe have them, after you take a look at them, then ship the actual original files to them for them to hold on to it. Um, make sure when you're looking at your due diligence docs and stuff you're making offers on and working through that you save the files to Dropbox and then take your scan files and save them to a Dropbox or a Box B or something electronically. Um, in case somehow the original file is destroyed or lost. And then you could do a lost note affidavit or something like that, but make sure you scan the files and keep them somewhere safe. Um, when you get the collateral files, if you're storing them in a safe place, put them somewhere in, in like fireproof boxes, a gun safe, a safe deposit box. Me, I put them in, in big boxes on a, a self-storage facility up off the first or second floor so they're not likely to burn or anything like that. I don't want, you know, you don't want your dog to eat your collateral files. You don't want your kids to pull the collateral files out for scratch paper. You know what I'm saying? Um, your, ser your servicing company may offer collateral file storage. Just find out what they charge on a monthly or annual basis, okay? Uh, now, when you sell off an asset, you're going to be transferring that collateral file. You'll be transferring servicing. You still may want to hold on to the electronic docs, but if you foreclosed on an asset and then sold the property off as an REO, I wouldn't hold beyond, I wouldn't hold on to the files longer than three years. You may, just because it may be fun to look through that stuff, but um, you know, you may want to get rid of it. I've got some stuff that I need to get rid of. I need to purge for myself storage and on dead files, stuff that we sold off, stuff that we foreclosed on and took the asset back and then sold it off. But beyond three years, yeah, you don't need to really hold on to that stuff. Okay. Now the property, there's due diligence on the obviously on the property. And then we're talking about once you've closed on the note, okay. If you if the asset is vacant, you want to secure your asset. That means going out and changing the locks. Uh, now, if somebody's living in the property, you can't go change the locks, okay? But if it's vacant, you have the whole right to go out there and change the locks to secure it. Board up a window if you need to protect your investment, okay? Um, I would. I always like to send my realtor out with a locksmith so that A, they can get in and change the locks and she can she or he can go ahead and take photos to see what kind of condition the property is in, okay? If it's going, if you're going to be in an area that's going to be very cold with bad winter, you may want to go in and, and send a, a you know third party team to go out there and winterize the property, turn the water off, drain the pipes, make sure stuff doesn't burst. Okay. Um, like I said, have the realtor take photos. They will be great before photos. So you have them for your marketing and then you're after if you have to repair the property, that stuff like that. Um, I will sometimes post notice of abandoned property with your company or realtor contact information. If they're not responding. This is a trick that we've done in the past, posting, going and posting a big yellow sticker on the, on the front door saying, hey, we believe this property's abandoned. Contact me. That'll often get the borrowers calling in kind of a sneaky way in some cases, okay? Uh, and notice, you, if it's a vacant property, notify your insurance company immediately because that may change up the, the insurance coverage for you. Um, if you start, if you sell the action, you know, if you take the property to foreclosure, sell the auction, let them know, hey, we sold the sold it at auction. We did a foreclosure auction. It's no longer ours. Let them know if they charge you for a month, they can go back and credit it up to the point of sale for you. Um, 
I think the thing is just get out there and start looking at property. Don't wait around for stuff. Secure it. Change the locks. You know, if it is somebody's not there anymore and the realtor says, hey, it's in good condition. It's good. That's great. But make sure you secure your investment. And this is designed for you guys before, during, and after while you're going through due diligence. Obviously, you're going to learn more as you do your first deal. But this is designed not to overwhelm you. The 21 page one that I have, like I said, it's an engineer's wet dream created by an engineer who overthought everything and made it more confusing. This is, I want to say it's not a watered down version. It's a version of me going through my deals. And I, I sat here and said, okay, I'm going through these deals. And if you attended our one day due diligence course a few months ago, this is exactly the process I went through and shared with you every step of the way when we looked at that deal. And every step of the way, when I go through deals, this is what we do. And checking out. Okay, this is checked out. It's good. It's secured. My realtor's good. We're going through the foreclosure. We got to wait before we can do anything um, and go from there. So, are there any questions? And I am monitoring the online comments for those that are watching live on YouTube. So, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat roll. I'd be glad to share uh, my expertise, my 14 years in, of we close notes, my uh, hard to believe 16 years as a note investor out there. 17, actually, if you think about when we bought our first note. Now, the owner finance notes, you definitely want to take a look. Obviously, like I said, make sure they're Dodd-Frank blind. Look at the same collateral file. Yeah, you know, make sure it's, everything makes sense on that note. You know, um, now if you're creating notes, that's a whole different thing you want to think about. We should probably do an episode on if, how to create the, the correct paper, best sellable paper for you in the next couple of weeks. And that's probably what we'll do. Okay. The same thing. If they don't have a big collateral file, their stuff missing, you're going to need to reduce your bid. They don't have a third-party servicer on that note. They've been self-servicing. You definitely, I would reduce the, the offering because unless they have really extensive records of everything, now you've got, you're kind of fumbling around in the dark to find the answers to what you're looking for. Okay. Was this valuable to you guys? For those that are on here live with us? Yes, no. Can I get some thumbs up there in the chat roll, whether it's here on Zoom or on YouTube as well for me? Don, thank you very much, buddy. And Don, you're part of the WCN membership. We look forward to seeing you here in Austin in a few weeks, but you've got this access is on your base camp too for you to use. And it's, I left it in, in Word docs. You can go tweak it. Everybody has a few different things they do differently unique to them, okay? You know, some people I, I like to call the cops to ask about crime zone. Well, if you have to call a cops about a crime zone area, you gotta be careful. If it's not showing online, be careful about that. You know what I mean? But South Chicago, uh, Gary, Indiana's got some rough spots, other places out there. You know, I wouldn't be buying in San Francisco either. But take a look at this stuff and go from there. So hopefully this was valuable for you guys. If there's no other questions or comments, uh, like I said, I'd love to see you guys in Austin, Texas. It's hard to believe we're just over three, we're three and a half, four weeks out. You can get signed up for the virtual note buying workshop by going to notebuyingfordummies.com. Oops, previous one. And like I said, I think it's at 229, 230 per ticket right now. Take advantage of it, get signed up, come to be one of the lucky 50 people spending a couple of days with me here in Austin, Texas. We'll have some uh, cold air conditioning and while the deals are hot outside and then obviously make sure and take care of it and have some fun for three days. So love to see you here in Austin. Uh, like I said, when we fill up with 50, closing the doors and leave it that because that's what the uh, hotels will hold for you. So any other questions, comments, concerns before I let you guys go on this Monday night? I hope this was valuable to you. If you're listening to this on the podcast, thank you for listening. Feel free to leave a comment or a five-star review. Love to hear what you like most. And once again, guys, uh, hard to believe 14 years have flown by. We plan on being here a lot longer than another 14. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of Note Night in America and part of the We Close Notes family. So have a great evening, everybody. And uh, we'll see you at the top, everybody. Bye.